Chapter 3, The Long Walk Home Instead of calling his wife to come get him, George decided to walk home the two or so miles from the repair shop. He walked more today than he had in several years. But at this point, he didn't feel like talking to anyone, especially his wife. Car in the repair shop for two weeks, he thought. What else can go wrong? He was near his breaking point. Just last night, his wife had told him that she was unhappy in their marriage, and George's negativity was making the entire family miserable. She had given him an ultimatum, change or it was over. It wasn't the first of their marital problems, and certainly it wasn't the first time she had told George he was negative. But now it was real, and he didn't want to lose the woman he loved. He knew she loved him too, but as she had said, no matter how much she loved him, she wouldn't live with someone who made her life so miserable. He vowed to change, but for the first time in his life, he was at a loss. He felt like his life was spitting out of control and he couldn't do anything to stop it. He had always been able to fix every problem and rise to every occasion to meet any challenge, especially in his marriage. Yet now he felt truly powerless as if his life was being lived by someone else while he watched it unravel. That night he had yelled to the heavens, asking for help, and had woken up with a flat tire. Some help, he thought. Just one more problem I don't need right now. George walked briskly, hoping to get home in time to read the kids a book. It was one of the few things he enjoyed doing, and it was something they loved as well. Whenever he was working in his home office, they would always come in and say it was time for him to read a book, which he always did. His two kids were his driving force. He loved his family, and he wanted to be able to provide for them and give them everything he had never had. They had a beautiful home, the school district was one of the best in the state, and the children thrived. He and his wife drove new cars and did their best to keep up with the Joneses, the Smiths, and whoever else they were supposed to keep up with. Yet with his family also came great pressure and responsibility. Work hadn't been going so well, and his last review was very troubling. His team was in disarray. Their productivity was in the toilet, and George had been told that if he didn't get it together, he would be replaced. For the first time in his life, his job was in serious jeopardy. So as George walked, he thought of his family, his wife's ultimatum, and his job. He was in danger of losing it all, and the car problem was the final straw. Something good has to be coming my way, he thought. It can't continue like this or else I'm done. My life wasn't always like this, he shouted to the stars. I was a young go-getter once. Everyone talked about my great potential. I was a rising star in my company. My future was bright. I squeezed the juice out of life. Now, I can't even get my hands on a piece of fruit. I can't take this anymore, he yelled. Please help me, he shouted as he looked up to the moonlit sky. The air was silent, and George heard nothing except the sound of his own breath. He was waiting for something, a word, a sound, a bolt of lightning. He wasn't sure what, but something. Chapter 4, George Wakes Up George woke up the next morning, feeling tired, anxious, and stressed as usual. Every day he wondered what else was going to go wrong, but at least today, he knew he wouldn't have car problems. Do you want me to drive you today, his wife asked. I do have time. No, it's okay, he answered. I'll take the bus. It's not that bad, except for the driver. What's wrong with the driver, she asked. Long story. I'll tell you later, he said, as he put on his sneakers for his trek to the bus stop. Then his mood turned even more sour as he thought about seeing the bus driver who had insulted him. Choose wisely, soap opera, stuck in his head. Who did she think she was talking to? He shook his head and then turned his attention towards his sneakers because it became painfully obvious that he wasn't able to untie his shoes. The laces were tied in 20 different knots and he knew full well that his kids had been playing in his closet again. He threw his shoes against the wall, breathed a big huff, and just sat in painful silence. More silence. A minute later, he looked in the mirror above his dresser and saw himself as he heard a voice from his own conscience saying, You, the bus driver was talking to you. You're the one with the failing marriage. You're the one who is about to get fired, who now doesn't even have a car to drive to work and can't even put on your own shoes. You're the one living a soap opera. The realization 
hit him unexpectedly. He couldn't disagree with Joy. She was right. His life and career had hit rock bottom. Even his boss and biggest supporter and mentor had sat in his office yesterday and told him he couldn't vouch for him anymore. I can't carry you anymore, his boss said. I don't want to be carried, George replied. But that's what I've been doing. Everyone's asking me, what happened to George? And I'm saying, I don't know, but he'll get it together. Well, now they're looking at me saying, he better get it together or else you'll both be gone. I love you, George, like a son, but I can't let you bring me down too. I've worked too hard for this. I have kids in college. I will get it together, George declared. We'll see, said his boss. As my old football coach used to say, we don't talk this game, we play it. So I hope to see some action soon because if you don't get it together, then we both know what has to happen. Fired was a word George never thought he would hear. And now he was hearing it all too frequently in the same sentence with his name. I need to try to turn this around today, he thought. How? I have no idea. Chapter 5, No Joy on the Bus George finally got his shoes on, and as he walked to the bus stop, Joy the bus driver and her smile popped into his head. Maybe she's not all that bad, after all. She pegged you, George, he thought to himself. But do I really need another person telling me how much my life stinks? I mean, not only do I have to hear from my boss and my wife, but now I even have a bus driver and total stranger on me. Who would be next to tell me what a loser I am? The mailman? He made it to the bus stop in plenty of time and waited for bus number 11 to pull up, expecting to see Joy at the wheel. But when the bus arrived, Joy was nowhere to be found. Instead, a man was at the wheel, and he certainly didn't have the smile nor the welcome she had. George wondered what happened to her. He felt bad for being rude to her. After all, she was only trying to be nice, and it wasn't her fault my life is in the toilet, he thought. George sat quietly on the bus, no conversation, no smiling, and certainly no energy. He thought about yesterday's meeting with his boss and the meeting he had with his team. He knew some changes had to happen, and they had to happen quickly. He was ready to do something. What he wasn't sure, but he knew he needed to do something to save his job, his family, and his marriage. He would start today, he thought. Chapter 6, The Rules George arrived even earlier the next day at the bus stop. He sat on the bench and thought about work yesterday and how he wanted to make an impact and get things moving in the right direction. But as usual, one crisis had led to another, and he and his team had spent most of the day dealing with conflict and putting out fires rather than getting something done. George thought about each member of his team and how each one contributed to his growing problems. I should fire every one of them. The thought made him smile, but then reality set in and he knew that there was no way he could do that. If anything, he was the one who would be leaving the company before any of them. Besides, they weren't bad people. He had even hired a few of them. They had just lost their way somehow, he thought. Like a bad marriage, he figured, where you can't figure any one thing as the cause, yet you know it just isn't right. George was in such deep thought that he didn't hear bus number 11 pull up. When he looked up, he saw Joy once again at the wheel, and her smile made him smile. Well, look at here. Look who we have here today. How you doing, sugar? I didn't think I'd see you again. Me neither, answered George. I was on the bus yesterday too, but you weren't here. Where were you, he asked. Tuesday's my day off, sugar. It's the day I take care of my sick father. He can't remember anything anymore. He doesn't remember his name nor his pride and joy. Can you imagine not being able to remember me? Not easy to see your father every week and he has no idea who you are. I'm sorry, said George, feeling bad that he hadn't thought she had a care in the world. Everything is not always as it seems. Don't be sorry, sugar. It's part of life. Every one of us has got challenges. Everyone who comes on this bus has problems. Some got marriage problems, health problems, family problems, work problems, and some got all kinds of problems. It's part of life. And I'm just another person on the bus who's got another problem. But you're so happy and cheery, said George. How do you stay so happy? It's just what I'm all about, sugar. It's because I love life. It's because I love you. And it's because I love me. How can I love myself if I don't love you? How can I love myself if I don't love everyone? You see, we're all connected. And I love it all. Even the ones who are hard to love. Like me, George thought. 
Yes, like you, George, she said, reading his mind. And how about you, she asked. What are you doing on my bus again? I thought we had seen the last of you after you ran off the bus faster than Carl Lewis at the 1984 Olympics. I consider myself blessed not once, but twice with your presence. So please do tell. George told her about the flat tire, the repair shop, the brakes, and how he could have crashed if he had driven the car, and how he would have to take the bus for about two weeks. Well, that's just great, George. The fact that you're going to be riding on my bus is a great thing. As I said the other day, you're on my bus for a reason. I didn't know why exactly, but I do know now. George asked why, curiously, not quite catching on. What's so great about having your car in the shop for two weeks, he asked. Man, your head is hard to crack, but I'm going to be gentle with you. Look up there, George. To the right of the mirror, tell me what you see. A sign, said George. That's right, a sign. And what does that sign say? It says the 10 rules for the ride of your life. Underneath the headline was a list of 10 rules that George really couldn't make out. He didn't have his reading glasses on and the words were blurry. Besides, the sign's letters were handwritten and not very legible. That's right, sugar. All my long-term passengers learn these 10 rules. We talk about them often and now I get to share them with you. I'm so excited, she cheered. Look at the big picture here, George. This ain't no coincidence. We got about 10 days on my bus together and I got 10 rules for the ride of your life. George squirmed a little in his seat. I have enough rules in my life, he said. Wife rules, home rules, little league rules. The last thing I want is more rules. Joy turned very serious for a moment. Her smile turned into a dead stare as she looked George right in the eye. You need these rules, George, she declared firmly. Never turn your back on something that will change your life forever. You got 10 days, and I got 10 rules that will change your life. Great things are coming your way if you're open, George. Be open. Please, be open. And at that, she smiled brightly once again and asked, Are you with me? In a calm, firm voice that made it clear she wasn't taking no for an answer. Yes, George answered, not believing he was actually agreeing to this. And all at once, the entire bus cheered, Yes, yes, yes. George looked around and for the first time realized that there were a group of other passengers on the bus as well. Don't be scared, Joy said. We always chant yes when a long-term passenger agrees to learn the 10 rules. It's our thing. It's what makes this the energy bus. We're all about positive energy here, and it's what makes this ride so great. You don't get more positive than the word yes, so are you ready to learn rule number one? We've got five minutes before we get to your stop, and this is a quick one. George nodded, still in a little shock. Everything was moving really fast, and a bunch of mixed feelings were swirling around inside him. On one hand, he wanted to jump out the window, while on the other hand, he was really curious to learn the 10 rules. After all, what did he have to lose? At this point, nothing, he thought. 